Hey everyone, Mr. Sujano here. In this video, we're checking out the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Let's get started. All right, to kick things off, I purchased this Retroid Pocket 2 for a fair and honest review, and that's exactly what we're gonna do here. I initially ordered the 16-bit, the SNES version, and people advised me that the button sticks, so I swapped that out really quickly for the orange version. Opening up the box here and the packaging is simple and straightforward. The very first thing I see is the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And underneath the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, I do see a few additional things. We've got this beautifully cracked tempered glass screen protector. As you may have guessed, I'm probably not going to use this. There's a pretty simple and straightforward instruction manual. And a USB-C cable with purple inserts. My first time holding this Retroid Pocket 2 Plus and it feels a lot better than I thought it was going to. At 100 bucks, I thought this was going to honestly feel a little bit cheap but it does feel very well put together. On the bottom here, we have the SD card slot as well as a headphone jack. And the micro SD card slot has a nice rubber protector. On the top of the unit, we've got the L1, L2, R1, and R2 shoulder buttons. We have an HDMI out, a USB-C port, volume rocker, and power button. It's also worth pointing out that this is a micro HDMI port, not a mini HDMI. There is a pretty big difference between the two. On the right side of the device, there is nothing. On the left side of the device, there is nothing. And on the back of the device, there's also not a whole lot going on. There are four rubber plugs here with access to screws. Now, holding the Pocket 2 Plus in my hands here isn't necessarily uncomfortable, but I wouldn't say it's comfortable either. The bottom two corners do dig into my palms just a little bit. There's no option here for L3 and R3. The joysticks do not click in. On top of that, the right joystick is a really weird slider. The left joystick feels absolutely fine, but the right one slides around really awkwardly. If you're playing a game that requires two joysticks, you're probably not going to like this experience. The D-pad on this device feels pretty good. It presses down in the center and pivots around nicely. There is no grinding, it's pretty smooth. And unsurprisingly, the shoulder buttons on this device are not analog, so if you're playing a racing game, it's either full throttle or nothing at all. Now, booting up the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus was a very pleasant experience. I was not expecting this splash screen at all, and I absolutely love it. The initial setup process was also simple and straightforward. There's a menu system you can navigate to initially configure this thing. During the setup process, there's also a bunch of apps you can select to pre-install on the device. I don't necessarily recommend doing this. The very first option here is Citra Enhanced. And Citra Enhanced isn't necessarily being actively developed. It did die out for a bit. It is coming back, but some of these apps are a little bit outdated and not necessarily ones I'd be choosing. My advice would be to go to the Google Play Store and just download the emulators you want to use, unless you're not familiar with that. If you're not familiar with emulation at all, if you're not familiar with these retro handhelds, this might be a viable option just using the pre-installed apps but I can pretty much guarantee you it won't be the optimal experience. At the end of the setup process, you can select your launcher. There's the RP2 Plus launcher and the AOSP launcher. I prefer the AOSP launcher for a more Android-like experience. I find it's easier to configure the emulators, find your games, and go from there. But if you like a contained view, kind of like RetroPie, well then pick the RP2 Plus launcher. Here's a quick view of the RP2 Plus launcher. I'm not a fan of it, but some people are. And here's the much nicer AOSP launcher. Now if you want the best of both worlds, just select the AOSP launcher and then select the Retroid Launcher app from this menu. The Retroid Launcher app will bring up that interface for you. For some reason as well, I completely forgot that this was a touchscreen and it was a very pleasant surprise. Also surprising at this price point. And the touchscreen works very well. If you're moving the Retroid Pocket around a lot and it's switching orientations on you, there is a forced landscape option right on the main menu. You may want to use it, you may not. It's entirely up to you. A nice feature about the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is that it does feature an over-the-air updater, and it does alert you. You don't have to go searching yourself. So if you do boot this up and it says System Update, I highly recommend clicking on it. I would say the update process is pretty simple and straightforward, but not without its hiccups. My update here started out without a hitch, but at some point in the process, it did give me some sort of error and asked me to retry. 
and it wasn't due to an internet connection at all. My internet was absolutely fine. In fact, the download process had already started. Fortunately though, retrying was pretty simple and straightforward. I just pressed the retry button and it tried again, and this time it updated without issue. Now this is a minor gripe, but while the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus was updating, I noticed that underneath the joystick didn't line up perfectly with the shell. This probably won't bother many people at all, but it is worth pointing out. Now moving on to emulation on this device, which is arguably the most important thing about it, and I am pleasantly surprised, kind of shocked. This is Aether SX2, the PS2 emulator on Android, up and running. It's playing Capcom vs SNK2 here at full speed, not dropping frames. Seriously impressive. Now I will say here, don't get ahead of yourself, it's not going to run every single PS2 game well. Capcom vs SNK2 is an easier game to run and I was surprised it could run it in the first place. It's also worth pointing out that the D-pad is a lot better than I was expecting. It is working extremely well. Checking out ReDream, one of the baked in Dreamcast emulators on this device and it's running fairly well. It's full speed here but I'm noticing a lot of screen tearing so some configuration will be required. It's not necessarily plug and play. In fact, I would argue that configuration is mandatory considering that controls probably won't be set up correctly right out of the gate. Playing crazy taxi here and the taxi won't go and that's because the buttons aren't configured correctly. So I would argue here that this isn't necessarily a device for someone who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't care to learn. You will have to get your hands dirty just a little bit. Moving on from Dreamcast and checking out GameCube. GameCube emulation on this device isn't necessarily the greatest. This is the latest development version of Dolphin, and I'm playing Twilight Princess at a whopping 10 frames a second. And switching over to the included Dolphin MMJR2 emulator with this device, and well, that one just flat out froze. It wasn't working at all, at least not for Twilight Princess. So your GameCube experience on this device will be completely hit and miss, and it will be on a per game basis. I also don't recommend using the baked in emulators on this device. Now moving on to the 3DS, another heavy hitting system to emulate, and I'm using Citra MMJ that I manually installed on this device. This is a link between worlds, we're getting around 25 frames a second, up to 30 in some cases, but the game is running nowhere near full speed. Your 3DS emulation experience will completely vary based from game to game. I mean, some of the lighter games will run better, but some of the more demanding games like this one will run worse. As for the price and specs of this device, things are very interesting. This is priced at $99. I said $100 before, I rounded up just a little bit. Uh, but that is a very inexpensive price for what you're getting in return. The CPU on this is an interesting one, it's a Tiger 310. It has 2 gigs of DDR4 RAM and 32 gigs of baked in storage. You will be required to buy a micro SD card if you have a bunch of games. It's running Android 9, so you don't have to worry about any sort of scope storage issues. It has 2.4G and 5G Wi Fi and 5.0 Bluetooth. The battery on this one is 4,000 milliamp hours. In terms of overall battery life, it will vary based on the emulator you're using and how much CPU you're using, as well as your screen brightness. There are a bunch of factors that will play into your overall battery usage, but expect between roughly three to five hours of gameplay. In sleep mode, this thing can be asleep for days and still have a charge. The screen on this one isn't the biggest, it's 3.5 inches at 480p with an aspect ratio of 4x3. The 4x3 aspect ratio is relatively perfect for a lot of retro games. On top of that, it is a touch screen, which is a huge bonus and it does have rumble if you like that. The Pocket 2 Plus comes in a bunch of different colors, but there is something worth pointing out. I initially pre-ordered the SNES version and a bunch of people told me, don't cancel your pre-order because the buttons are painted and they don't really fit in the case the best. They grind against the edges a little bit. So I was lucky enough to be able to switch it to an orange version here, but I think if you get the orange, the purple, or the black version, you should be absolutely fine. I could be wrong though, let me know in the comments below. So let's get into my likes and dislikes about the Pocket 2 Plus, and we'll start out here with my dislikes. First and foremost, this is not a device for a novice. If you have never used emulators before, if you're picking this up for a younger sibling or a younger cousin or a nephew or something like that, configuration will be required. This isn't necessarily a set it and forget it device, especially if things are updating. And the apps that are included that you can pre-install on this are outdated already. On top of that, my screen protector was unfortunately broken, so I'm not using one. And I don't know if I'd want to use one anyway, considering this is a touchscreen. 
and I don't normally use a screen protector, so there's that. The right joystick on this device isn't a traditional joystick, it's a slider, so if you play a lot of games that require two joysticks, you're probably not going to have a good time here. For me, this wasn't an issue at all, and my thumb kind of goes over it so it doesn't touch, which is a nice plus, unlike some other retro handhelds. And a few more things here. The bottom corners are not great for longer gaming sessions. If you're playing this for a longer period of time, the corners might dig into your hands and they might get annoying. At least it did for me. If you're playing this in shorter bursts, it's probably not going to be an issue. And the shoulder buttons on this one, they're not analog, so if you like to play racing games, you've either got full throttle or nothing at all. And the last thing here, this really isn't that bad given the price point, but the CPU on this isn't really strong enough to handle PS2, GameCube, and 3DS. Yes, I showed you some games kind of working. But at the same time here, don't expect it for the entire PS2 library. I would say that this is not near powerful enough to do that. You might be able to get away with some games, but overall here you might need a more powerful device. And that brings me to what I like about this device, and there is quite a bit. In terms of emulation, pretty much everything under the GameCube was absolutely fine, including Dreamcast. And that is seriously impressive. On top of that, the D-pad on this was amazing. The build quality on this is very, very good. Yes, my screen protector was broken, and that's a bit of a bummer. But at the same time here, I probably wouldn't have used it. The fact that this has touchscreen on it is seriously impressive. I also love that it's running Android. I love that it gets OTA updates and the battery life, at least for me, was very impressive, especially given the size of it. To sum things up here, this was way better and performed way better than I was initially expecting. Now for the big question, whether or not I recommend the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus and is it worth it? At 99 bucks here, my answer is an overwhelmingly yes. If you're in the market for a retro gaming handheld, I would definitely check out the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. I think this device punches well above its weight. I think it's better than a lot of devices that are more expensive than it. But anyways, that is all I've got for you in this one. Straight to the point, haul stuff and no fluff. Let me know your thoughts on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus in the comments below. Do you already own one? Are you thinking about picking one up? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, leave a like. If you didn't like this video, leave a like. Hit that subscribe button, check out my other videos. Don't tempt fate, save your state.